Welcome to the debut episode of Booked on Rock. Our guest, Frank Meyer, co-author of On the Road with the Ramones, and author of When the Wall of Sound Met the New York Underground, the Ramones, Phil Spector, and End of the Century. At the time we're recording this episode, we will be coming up on what would be Joey Ramone's 70th birthday. He was born May 19th, 1951 in Queens, New York. Sadly, he passed in 2001 at the age of 49, but his legend lives on through his music. As lead vocalist of the Ramones, he became a countercultural icon. And here to talk about Joey and the Ramones is author Frank Meyer, who has released two Ramones books. He co-authored 2010's On the Road with the Ramones with Monty Melnick and was the author of the 2012 book When the Wall of Sound Met the New York Underground, the Ramones, Phil Spector, and End of the Century. To uh, hear the songs discussed in this episode, by the way, check out the show notes page. Frank, thanks for being on the podcast, man. Great to be here. Great to be here. Always happy to talk about the Ramones. Absolutely. Well, our association began through the Van Halen News Desk. So Frank, like me, is a huge VH fan. And, and back in December, we posted a killer cover of the song In a Simple Rhyme that you did with your band Streetwalk and Cheetahs. Uh, but you're a man of many talents, so somebody who loves many bands and artists, and I wanted to have you on to talk about your books on the Ramones because Joey's birthday is coming up. So before we get to the books, tell us who Frank Meyer is, where you're from, what got you into music, what got you into writing? Right on. Uh, yeah, man, I, I'm from Los Angeles. I mean, I was originally born in the Bay Area, but I moved to Los Angeles when I was a little kid. And uh, I grew up, you know, in the 80s Hollywood scene, that whole Sunset Strip scene and the punk scene and the metal scene that was going on in the 80s. So that certainly kind of sent me down the path. You know, like the first local bands I ever saw were like Guns N' Roses and Poison and Jane's Addiction when they were unsigned bands. So clearly that had some impact on me. And when I was a kid, I went to the same school as all the Zappa kids. So uh, Dweezil Zappa was an early friend of mine and he taught me how to play guitar so that certainly had some impact on my overall direction and obviously my love of van halen uh but i also really got into punk rock and i was really into like the new york dolls and the stooges and the mc5 and all that sort of almost like proto-punk and pre-punk uh that just really sounded like really raucous rock and roll and the Ramones sort of fit into that category in that they were kind of punk before people even really started calling it punk, or they were certainly among the first bands, them and the Sex Pistols and the Dam, where people started calling it punk rock. Um, but, you know, to me, when I first saw the Ramones, uh, it was on the movie, it was in the movie Rock and Roll High School when I was a little kid, and I loved watching tv and i love horror movies and i love genre movies and all that stuff and i saw rock and roll high school as a kid and that had impact on me uh as did you know a lot of rock and roll early on as a kid um i started playing guitar and i started playing music and i was also a writer so my whole career has kind of been being a musician who as my way to make my living, you know, bread and butter, because playing music, especially punk rock, doesn't necessarily pay a lot of money. Uh, even if you get signed and you go on tour, which my band, The Street Walk and Cheetahs, did all those things, but we were still always struggling to, to, to make money. So I was writing a lot and I was working in production and my writing career took me into writing a bunch of different books. I actually, speaking of Van Halen, uh, worked with Niels Lozauer on one of his Van Halen books called Van Halen, A Visual History. I did a couple of Ramones books. I ghost wrote a book with Dave Mustaine. Uh, I did a bunch of stuff in that area. But I was also in production, and I directed two documentary uh, music documentary fe feature films. And I was also working at NBC, and I was working at Fender Musical Instruments, directing and producing a lot of their digital content and tutorial content. So... So my career has always sort of been this weird three-headed beast between being a musician, being a director, producer, and being a writer. Uh, and really, the Ramones were kind of one of the things that kickstarted a lot of my career because, like I said, they were an early influence, and they were the first book I wrote. Uh, I got teamed up with Monty Melnick, for, who was the Ramones tour manager, through a guy who you might be familiar with named Lon Friend. He was the editor of Rip Magazine. Remember the yes. heavy metal, hard rock, 80s magazine? Oh, yeah. Rip? Yeah. 
So I was like you, you know, a kid that grew up on like Rip and Cream and Hit Parader and Kerrang and all those like hard rock, heavy metal the magazines. anti-Rolling Stone. Yeah, right? exactly. All and I was also reading Flipside and Maximum Rock and Roll, which were sort of the punk version. So anything that was kind of like rebel music or rebel journalism or rebel comic books. I was really into underground comic books and I loved underground movies and weird indie films and horror movies and all this stuff. And so that was just sort of where my head was at forever. But um, I met Lon through a magazine called Pop Smear. Uh, we crossed paths through that. I was working for Pop Smear. I'd interviewed David Lee Roth a bunch for Pop Smear. And um, Lon and I met and Lon friend from Rip Magazine, uh, got a gig at Sanctuary. Uh, remember Sanctuary Records? They had they were yeah. I, I spun out of Iron Maiden and they had a lot of heavy metal stuff. They had a publishing company at one point. Lon was working with them and they struck a deal with Monty Melnick to tell his version of the Ramones story because they had the same tour. This is an unusual thing about the Ramones. There's many unusual things about the Ramones, but one of them is that their entire career, you know, 26, 27 years, one tour manager who saw every single gig except for maybe like two he had he was sick on and that was monty so uh sanctuary and, and lawn had struck a deal with monty to tell his story which seemed like a unique one and he had and he had like their passports and photos and backstage stuff and memorabilia and just you know you knew it was going to be a dope book but they were hooking him up with all these writers that were sort of like these nerdy rock journalists in a way that I've gotten a lot of my gigs is just kind of being a a good writer. I, I hope to say, I like to say, um, but also being like a, a decent hang. Like we can sit here like I am right now and have a beer and, uh, and just chit chat about rock and roll. And like, you know, I kind of know my shit and we can have a good time. And so uh, Monty, when he got my number and called me, I was on tour with the street walk and cheetahs in Berlin, Germany. And I went to an internet cafe and when he asked, like, oh, why is the connection so bad? I said, well, I'm actually in Berlin. He's like, Berlin? What are you doing in Berlin? I said, well, I'm on tour with my punk rock band. He goes, you are? Boy, the Ramones played Berlin a lot. And all of a sudden we started talking about touring in Berlin in a van. And boom, like we were buddies. And so that kind of got me in with him. And then we wrote that book. And that really, that book sort of, you know, gave me a lot of street cred as a musician, as a writer, just in show business. So sure. I owe a lot of my career to, to I, owe, I, owe, I owe a lot to to Monty Melnick and also to Lon Friend. And so what led to you teaming up with him for this book? Was that something he approached you about? You approached him? Well, or you guys I mean, just both came together and said, let's do this? It was sort of like he wanted he wanted to tell his story, but he's not necessarily a writer, but he had lived this great life and he needed someone not only that could that could help him get it together, but also help him sort of, you know, voice it. I mean, sometimes he would write stuff down and write these sort of things and I would sort of edit that, but sometimes we would just talk and he would, we would do interviews and I would take those interviews and sort of turn them into text based on like what he had to say in his voice. And, you know, just a lot of it was me getting in his head and just kind of being able to help him tell his story, but still in his voice. So the way that book was structured is that like each chapter I sort of open with like in my voice, sort of an overview, sort of like, here's what's going on at this era of the career. They're making this album, they're doing this. And then it goes to this oral history where Monty is sort of the leading voice as all these other folks chime in and tell the story of the Ramones. So it's really, it's Monty's life story and his point of view of the Ramones, but it's also sort of an oral history of the Ramones because I loved books. Like I really love please kill me. I don't know if you read that book and I no. love the book, the dirt, please the kill dirt, me. Is by yeah. like, the dirt's a great one. And the dirt is an oral history of Motley Crue, meaning not only is it all four members, but it's, you know, managers and wives and roadies and other people chiming in. And, um, please kill me was before that. And it was by legs McNeil and it was um, basically the oral history of the CBGBs and sort of the New York, late New York, you know, scene and the punk rock scene there. And it's a, so it's the Dead Boys and it's the New York Dolls and Johnny Thunders and the Dictators and the Talking Heads and Blondie and, you know, that whole scene. Uh, and and it's equally phenomenal and equally filled with just like heroin and madness and prostitution and crazy. I mean, it's just like the most rock and roll over the top shit you've ever read in your fucking life. Wow. I thought that the, the Please Kill Me was the gnarliest book I'd ever read about rock and roll since Led Zeppelin's Hammer of the Gods. Hammer of the Gods was sort of the gnarliest 
rock book when I was a kid. And then Please Kill Me, I was like, oh, fuck Hammer, the gods do. Please Kill, Please Kill Me is way more insane. And then The Dirt dwarf them all because the dwarf the dirt's just like the most insane rock book of all time. yeah you don't even have to like motley crew to like the dirt because it's just a great book oh it is it is and Mon- monty over two thousand shows that he saw yeah he I mean, you know monty saw everything and so that's why he was the best person to tell the ramones story that didn't have an axe to grind you know the thing about the ramones is like many great bands is that once they broke up and even when they were together, they, there was, you know, factions and sort of warring tribes within the Ramones. So everyone within the Ramones kind of has like, well, I'm on Johnny's side or I'm on Joey's side or I'm, you know what I mean? Whereas Monty really was sort of always like, he was like the fifth Ramon. Like he was the one that really was friends with everybody. So even when they were all infighting, they, Monty was sort of the one guy that they would all confide in, all go to that, you know, he would call him up to get him back together to do things and stuff. Yeah. And so he had a great role in that band and, and over their entire career and, and after their career, because he then went on to manage and tour manage Dee Dee and he went on to tour manage Joey and, you know, he continued working with those guys, Tommy, you know what I mean? He, he continued. And what's Monty up to these days? Uh, Monty happily well, retired. So- yeah, he's retired, but you know, and you know, like many people, I mean, like I said, so, so when I, wrote the book with him i stayed at his place for a few weeks and then you know since then i've gone there a few times here and there and visited him and stuff but where does he live so he's i mean he's still in queens he's still in the area that that they all grew up in and stuff uh not the exact area but he's still in that general neighborhood and uh uh he had when i went there this room that was just filled with ramon's memorabilia and that's where i slept for those two weeks that we wrote the book so it was kind of crazy because i would like you know, I'd be like, good night, Monty. And I'd close the door and then be like looking through these like filing. I'm like, oh, my God, take a look at this. Oh, yeah. But, but I'd be like taking notes, like getting ideas like, oh, we should have a page with all the passport photos and we should do yeah. this. And, uh, and so, you know, eventually he started selling some of that stuff and doing the eBay thing, uh, as many, many folks do, get, getting into the whole memorabilia business. Because there's a whole I didn't even know this. I mean, Monty kind of hit me to it. There's like this whole memorabilia business for like signed stuff and this and and he had so much stuff. He was the keeper of all that stuff. So he, uh, you know, I think he's done well with that. But also he has uh, made a bunch of different versions of our book. He's really been like the leader and the, the the sort of charging force behind on the road with the Ramones, which is now in eight different languages and in five different pressings. And um, I've been involved, but Monty's the guy who's really like kept pushing it. And we've gone through a few different publishing companies and, you know, he's the guy that just champions it. And, you know, God bless. You quote longtime producer Ed Stasium. Stasium, is it pronounced? Ed Stasium. Stasium, who said, Tommy was the intellectual, Johnny was the taskmaster, Dee Dee was the true punk, and Joey was Joey. What was Monty's relationship like with Joey? Um, well, Joey and Monty were really, really close. I think he, they might have been the closest of all the guys in the band. Uh, and like I said, Monty was close with everybody. But Joey, you know, the reason why he says Joey is Joey there is that Joey had a lot of issues. Joey had extreme OCD, and that had a major impact on the the functionality of the group. Because uh, there's a story in there where, like, they got off the plane from Tokyo, and Joey turns to Monty and goes, "Monty, we got to go back." And he goes, "Back like to the plane and get something off your seat." And he goes, "No, we have to go back to Tokyo." And he goes, "Why would you go back to Tokyo?" And he goes, "Well." On the way up the runway, I forgot to touch the and count the right amount of times. And so in his mind, he like couldn't, you know, accept that and had to wanted to go back. And they were like, get in the goddamn van, Joey. But, you know, that was something that was going on with Joey for a long time. And the other band members, I think, became a lot less forgiving about that. You know, it was sort of like they'd make fun of him. They'd call him, you know, names. They, You know, he became sort of within the band. Sometimes that's something they would give him a hard time about. Whereas I think Monty was someone that always had a lot more empathy towards Joey. Uh, And like I said, when the band broke up, Monty and Joey stayed very close and continued to work together. So they were they were close. Was the OCD diagnosed at that time or did he ever get it diagnosed before he passed? I think it did. 
uh, I think it did get diagnosed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't think in the early days it was definitely not diagnosed. And I think everyone just thought he was a weirdo. Uh, or maybe it got diagnosed loosely, you know, in the sense that like a doctor might be like, hey, here, take these pills. And just, you know, but I, I don't think they called it OCD until like the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. And that's a hard thing. You, you're, you're this tough dude in a punk rock band. You really don't want to admit that you have this type well, of... Well, and also Joey, you know, yeah, Joey always... I mean, he was a, he was really, really tall and gangly. And he had originally... I, I'm Forgive me for not getting all the details specific here because it's been a while since I've done this level of detailed research. But uh, he was born with some sort of disease or spine thing. So, I mean, you know, Joey has an awkward look to him and it's it's one of the things that to me it's kind of so awesome about the ramones is that like or one of the things that attracted to me about the ramones is that like you look at joey ramone he does not really look like a rock star he looks you know like this sort of way too tall sort of hunched over and the hair he's almost got too much hair it's like it's great and it's deep and it's black but it was like it looks like a wig i don't think it was ever a wig but like he it just looked like this giant thing and and it, he just looked like a weird dude but he had this unbelievable voice he sounded like elvis and and he made much like buddy holly did i think like he made being a, a nerd and being not cool looking and being like awkward he made that cool and up until then, everyone's heroes were like James, you know, James Dean or James Brown or, you know what I mean? These cool looking svelte dudes with rad haircuts that could shimmy and dance. And you know what I mean? Like chiseled, you know, handsome Elvis for crying, a handsome man. Buddy Holly did not look like that. And Joey Ramone did not look like that. These yeah. guys were kind of punk rock in the sense that they really looked like weirdos and freaks. And then they had all this talent and all this presence. And, and in a weird way, I feel like even though like we were talking about Van Halen, and I certainly picked up the guitar because I heard Eddie Van Halen and, and it was just so mind boggling to me. But, but that didn't make me write songs. It made me want to do that instrument. Um, the Ramones and bands like the Ramones, um, the Runaways and T-Rex, that made me want to write songs because it was way more simple and way more like, oh, I can do that. Like Eddie Van Halen, I couldn't do any of that. I just was blown away by it when needed to explore it. And it was a fun thing to make that noise on a guitar and go with a whammy bar. Bam, you know? But like when I heard the Ramones, I was like the New York Dolls and Johnny Thunders. I was like, well, I could do that. That's that's just an A chord and a D chord. And, Shit, I know those two. And he's just turning his amp loud and going, bang. Yep. You know what I mean? There's a like, great interview with Kurt Cobain. And uh, when, 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 it's on YouTube. And he said yeah. he, he's almost just verbatim what you just said. He's just like, I, yeah. I, I looked at some of those technical wizardry guitarists and just I couldn't relate to it. But I heard I mean, punk. I loved it. I loved sure, it, but, but, I, but I didn't know how to wrap my brain around yep. that as a 12-year-old kid. But like. Yeah. But when I heard Joan Jett doing Bad Reputation and when I heard the Ramones and when I heard the Cramps and when I especially when I heard the New York Dolls, uh, I was like, oh, I I'm confident I can do that. Like, I didn't think I looked as cool as any of those people, but I was confident that I had my Fender amp that if I turned it really loud and struck that A chord and went, you know, just like I would want, you know, I would, I knew I could do it. And I, and that would sort of started my musical career uh, was just those simple punk rock and rock and roll stuff. Chuck Berry, you know, the stones. Yeah. And clearly there was an audience for it and it's, it starts in at the legendary CBGB club, New York city. That's the chapter three of on the road talks about their very first live gig, which was August of 74, right? What did, uh, right. What, what, what are the stories from that night that, uh, that, that Monty told you about? Well, I mean, the, the two things that stand out about that, and the funny thing is you can go on YouTube and there's a video of that show. There's a video of their very first show, and the two things that are noticeable about it is, A, the entire set is 20 minutes long, and they play, I don't know how many songs, but probably like 15 songs and you know, in uh, 20 minutes. And um, also, they were slightly glammy looking at that point. They hadn't quite settled into the leather jacket look. Uh, for those first few gigs, you know, the scene at that time was still kind of like 
the dictators and Blue Oyster Cult, and there was sort of, you know, the, the, the post Stooges and New York Dolls era. So everyone was still a little glammy and a little David Bowie influenced. And the first few Ramones gigs, they even had these sort of looser shirts with some sparkles. And, you know, it wasn't quite the jeans and T-shirts and leather that you see even a few months later. I'm looking here. Ramon CBGB, you, September 15th. But I'll tell you, when you hear it, they sound like the Ramones it's from the, the very first note. You hear it and you go, oh, there's the Ramones. Like, yeah. it's, it's not like they started off sounding glammy. They might have had a few different you know, outfits, but like they sound like the Ramones from the very first gig. Oh, you're right. Yeah, look at... Yeah, Joey's got almost like a, a sting shirt. The, the, sort the, of a, yeah, almost like a sequiny sort of... Uh, yeah, look at that, man. And Joey's like tripping out on stage. This is September 15 of 74. Yeah, CBG, so they, yeah. I mean, it, that's either the first or I mean, that one's, that's certainly right up there as one of the first gigs. And, uh, and like I said, they were, they, all the songs were short, but the sound was there. And if you watch that, it really is kind of like the birth of punk. I mean, the Stooges and the MC5 and the Velvet Underground were at, around before that. But the, those bands were not playing one and a half minute songs at that tempo. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's to me what makes the Ramones. Um, or Again, maybe you could you could say this about the Stooges because I got a right by the Stooges is absolutely a, a, a blueprint of punk rock. But when you hear that first Ramones record and when you watch that video that you're watching, like, that's what you call punk rock. Everything else before that, you kind of go, oh, it's proto-punk. It's not, you know, the MC5, you go, yeah, but they're sort of jazzy, too. And, like, that's not really punk. You know what I mean? Like, you can make all these arguments. Why not? But, like, the Ramones are before The Damned and before The Sex Pistols. And when you watch that first video in 74, which technically the New York Dolls were still around in 74 and the Dictators were around in 74, you know, things were still glam rock in 74, and like the Ramones came out sounding like that. And that is not glam rock. That is punk rock. Yeah. And Joey's quoted in the book saying the first people we played for were the bartender, his dog, and two guys from the Cockettes. The Cockettes, a psychedelic hippie theater group who performed. Yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and CBGB's also at first was not when the Ramones played there, it was still the tail end of being essentially a country western folk bar. Um, you know, the CBGBs didn't become a punk rock bar until the Ramones and Blondie and Talking Head and those bands. Hilly Crystal, who ran it and then eventually managed the Dead Boys, who were from Cleveland but moved out to New York, um, you know, he was running it as a, you know, a post hippie club, really. I mean, it was, you know, country and folk and blues. And then the Ramones and a few other groups came in and were doing this this different scene. And I, I'm in a wild guess that he just did a better bar, a better you know bar uh, tab that night. Meaning all of a sudden he went, oh shit, I made six hundred bucks at the bar when these weirdo punk fans played instead of the four hundred when the uh, when the hillbillies played. And he went, let me give them two nights a week and then three nights a week. And all of a sudden a punk rock club was born. But like, I don't think that Hilly Crystal, when he started off, was a punk rock fan. I think he was a guy that ran a bar and saw his idea of what his bar was going to be not making as much money over a few years. And then saw that there was this underground street scene happening right down a few blocks away and kind of just went like, sure, I'll let a few weirdos in here do their thing. And I'm just a wild guessing. It's probably as simple as like, because I know every bartender is not in the music. Anyone that runs a bar and has a stage, they're not in the music business. They're in the selling alcohol business. Sure. They're in the they're in the marking up of whiskey business. That's what running a bar is. If you have a band there, it's only because you think the band is going to sell you more whiskey and more beer. That's where you make your money. You, if you can afford to pay a band five hundred bucks, it's because you're making three grand at the bar. You know yeah, what I mean? Like yeah. that's the only. And if, you, and if you are making great enough money, why even hire a band? Because why deal with the extra security? You know what I mean? Like it's all most, especially back then. Like most band or most stages in bars were because the guy's trying to up his bar money that night. So, you know, I think punk rockers like to drink hard, and that's probably really what punk rock was born on. Sure, <laughs> they they made a movie on Hilly Crystal, didn't they? 
They did. You did. And, you know, the, I, I also played um, – I mean, a, a weird part of my career, besides being an author, is that in my band, The Streetwalking Cheetahs, we recorded a bunch of records on our own. And in fact, I'll give a quick plug. We have a brand new record out called One More Drink. Uh, you can get it on all your digital stuff. And it's also on um, it, it, it's on all digital platforms, it's on vinyl. It's on Deadbeat Records on vinyl and CD. But you can also get it on Bandcamp and all digital platforms. Anyways, um, we did a lot of sort of backing of other rock musicians where we would do like a tour and we'd be the support act, but then we would also like be come back into a second set backing up like Wayne Kramer from the MC five, or we backed up um, Cheetah Chrome from the dead boys. So Cheetah Chrome was managed by Hilly Crystal's CBGB's. We also backed up Sylvain Sylvain from the New York dolls and they played a lot of gigs there. We backed up Cherie Curry from the runaways. We backed up Dennis tech, uh, from Radio Birdman. I've been singing with James Williamson from the Stooges for years. And the weirdest one is I actually did a whole tour playing with Bob DeRoe of Schoolhouse Rock. Cool. We did a whole Schoolhouse Rock tour, and he's the guy that wrote all that stuff, and I played guitar and, and sang in the Schoolhouse Rock uh, band. We're talking about the TV show. Yeah, Conjunction, Junction, what's your function? So when they released all that stuff on Rhino, they assembled the original Schoolhouse Rock players and I knew the manager, and I got the gig and did the whole tour with him. Oh, this. man. You know, my one of my... I'm just a bill. I'm only yeah. a bill. One of my yeah. favorite Blind Melon songs, because I love Blind Melon, is Three is a Magic Number. Oh, well, I got to play Three is a Magic Number with the guy that wrote and sang it. Oh, on stage that's outstanding. Yeah, it was crazy. But anyway, so um, just going back to the CBGB's Hilly thing is that... Right. Um, I got to spend a lot of time with Cheetah Chrome from the Dead Boys over the years. And uh, Cheetah um, was managed for many years by Hilly Crystal. So that when CB's got swinging and was happening, Hilly branched out from just being a bar owner to starting to manage a few bands. And one of the bands that he managed, sort of the biggest band that he managed, was the Dead Boys. And the Dead Boys were a Cleveland band. They came up in Cleveland, which is where like Devo and uh, the Rubber City Rebels and a few other bands, Care Ubu, came out of Cleveland. And they came to New York to do all these gigs with the Ramones and the whole early CBGB scene. And then Hilly kind of was like, ooh, you guys are cool. Move here. I'll manage you. And then he started managing them. And that's what that movie is about. Yeah. Is uh, the move the Hilly Crystal movie is about not only CBGBs, but specifically it's about him managing the Dead Boys. Alan Rickman played him, didn't he? From, Alan Rickman played him. That was his that last kid. role before he passed, I think. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And the kid, the redheaded kid from Harry Potter, I'm spacing on his name. He plays Cheetah Chrome. Okay. I'm spacing on that kid's name, but you know what I'm talking about? The redheaded yeah, kid from yeah. Harry Potter. The movie yeah, is played. called CBGB. It definitely, if, if anybody ha- is listening to this, hasn't seen that movie, it's, it's definitely worth a watch. It's a really good performance, too. Yeah, there's a great documentary about Stiv Baders called Stiv. Um, but going back to the Ramones, there's a really, really great documentary about the Ramones called End of the Century. And around the time that Monty and I were working on the book, this film came out and we got to see it at the Tribeca Film Festival. And it's now on DVD and it's, you know, you can get it on, I say DVD, but I mean, you, of course, you can get it on digital yep. and all your pay-per-view stuff. Um, but uh, it's a really, really well done, well put together uh Everyone participated despite all the, the infighting with the, the band. They caught everyone before folks started passing away uh, or they got them right before they started passing away. And um, uh, it's a great movie. So if, you're, if you want to sort of get the overall story of the Ramones, A, read our book on the, remote, on the Road with the Ramones by Monty Melnick and myself. But uh, that movie, End of the Century, is fantastic. The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. We're back with more of the Booked on Rock podcast. Around 76, they start to tour outside of New York. They get the record deal. Next few years, it's like a whirlwind. Nonstop touring, endless parties, quite a bit of infighting with the band members. That started fairly early on. There's a lot. I mean, that's it's a long, you know, that era of the band, there was a lot going on. But the, the, the couple things that sort of jump out to me is uh, Dee Dee was the loose Ken in the band all along. He was also the genius songwriter. He was sort of the Brian Wilson of the band and that he was, you know, I mean, they 
talk about being an idiot savant, by no means am I saying he was an idiot, but like he was, you know, he wrote these genius lyrics, but he was this street kid. You know what I mean? He wasn't like this educated, poetic or trained songwriter. He was this kid from the corner and uh, he was, you know, he partied the hardest and he did the most drugs and he became the biggest casualty in the band or the quickest casualty in the band. Um, but he also was the biggest contributor to the band musically and um, or songwriting wise, certainly. So I think that Dee Dee being such a loose cannon in terms of his partying and being an irresponsible guy was sort of an all around issue in the band during his tenure. Uh, eventually they, they dismissed him because of that. Um, and even after that, he continued to write songs with them. He just didn't stay within the band, but he stayed friends with those guys. But the really big Johnny was the one. Well, the, I mean, the big, yeah, the big turmoil within the Ramones. Was, dec- they didn't talk for like over two decades, right? Well, yeah, and it was all over a, a love affair in the sense that Joey had a long-term girlfriend, Linda, that he was madly in love with, and Linda had an affair with Johnny, and it went on for quite some time, and and Joey didn't know, and eventually everyone knew, and the road crew knew, and Monty knew, and everyone knew, and Joey didn't do, know, so he was sort of, in a way, a bit of a cuckold, and I'm sure when he found out, he was probably embarrassed, um, but, you know, the reality is that Linda and Johnny ended up getting married and staying together until the day he died, and... Uh, Joey never quite forgave Johnny for stealing his girl. And that was in the early 80s. So when you consider that the Ramones went on for another, you know, 17 plus years or something after that, um, and those guys basically stopped talking around that time. I mean, Joey, you know, just really never forgave him. And I'm not saying that they didn't continue working together. They clearly did. But uh, they definitely were not, communicating in any other way besides whatever work needed to get done to keep their business, which was the Ramones moving forward and making them money. So um, it's a weird thing because the Ramones music is so, I mean, it's the Ramones music ha, is so, has so many things going on, but you, it, it, when you hear that music, it's hard to imagine that the two biggest long-term contributors spent damn near two decades not talking and really not being close at all over, you know, this huge spat over a, a love, a love loss, you know. Um, yet they continued making all this amazing music and all this amazing music that, like, sort of, you know, spoke for us. I mean, when I hear that music they made, like, it, it tells me about love. It tells me about hate. It tells me about, you know, weirdos. It tells me about protesting. It tells me about New York. It tells me about L.A. It's like such great music. And then when you think that there was so much turmoil, I mean, I guess turmoil is what bursts great art, but it's just hard to imagine that these guys were not even really friends. Yeah, that's that what makes it harder all. from the fans' perspective because you, you yeah. see that amazing chemistry that they had and you wish they could put put their differences aside howard stern tried to get them to talk right that's that was the yeah. thing that he had them both on the phone he, and they he took jabs him. at each other you know on the air yeah it, that was wild. all those guys marky and joey used to call into howard's show a lot either together and then separately arguing and then at one was point it mark okay who was who was the, who were the two who was joey talking to the howard stern well i mean he might have uh, don't get me wrong i'm not saying you're wrong he might have very well tried to broker a johnny can't remember conversation which, as well because joey was making that, fun of the other dude's wig no oh no that's marky yeah, yeah right that, right right marky big ones marky yeah yeah that one's a great that one's a great one you can find that on youtube as well which oh, is my basically God. They, they both accuse each other, I think, of wearing wigs. Yeah, um, which is funny, also because ha- people used to accuse Howard of wearing a wig. I know you have three three guys with similar hair, all of whom have been accused of wearing wigs. But uh, yeah, those guys in the in the in the late nineties and early two thousands, they all kind of famously hated each other, which is funny because it goes back to our whole Van Halen thing of like this band that we all love and are so close to yet they just had so much turmoil and they just actively hated each other for so long and then they finally came together and then even that was fraught with fucking drama i know you know it's just like it it can never be easy sometimes with these bands to be a fan and just be like hey let's make music i know how how many how many have we lost from the ramones now altogether who's left from the i mean yeah because we monty monty's who's left (laughs) yeah 
from the original? No, I mean, I mean, it, from the because Marky's not an original member, nor right. Mark Marky's alive and CJ's alive, but right. the, neither one of them are original members. Are original so members. Go, but Monty was in from day one. So if you go by lineup one, it's Monty. If you go by lineup two, it's Marky, and then after that, it would be CJ. So the only and then I mean, technically Richie Ramone is in there too. Uh, but he was barely – well, I, sh- I shouldn't say – yes, and Richie Ramone is alive too. And then there's also Clem Burke brief that's, – that's what I meant to say. Is that right. Clem Burke was briefly in the band. Um, but So Clem's alive if you count him. Richie's alive, but he was only in for a couple records. Marky was in it for a long time off and on, and he's alive. And CJ was – you know, he replaced Dee Dee and stayed in until the end. So those later members are alive, but the original lineup, they're all gone. Yeah, Clem is a- a.k.a. Elvis Ramone. Right. Wow. It's so hard to believe. It's crazy. So hard to believe. And and the really bummer thing about it is that we've all grown up hearing the Ramones and TV commercials and soundtracks and you know movies and TV. I mean you you know hey ho let's go you hear it in fucking everything now. Um that didn't start until after Joey had died and really even after Dee, Dee had died. I mean really Johnny as far as those original guys, Johnny and Tommy, uh, and Tommy didn't even play on some of that stuff. He did play on Hail, Let's Go, but Johnny was only, I mean, not Johnny, Tommy was only in the band for the first handful of records. Um, but meaning Joey never really got to see the huge impact that the Ramones had. That's, I think, the most heartbreaking thing is that like Joey was the guy who was like the heart and soul of the band. He was the, the like we were talking about before. He was the underdog of the band. He was the guy who physically re- represented to me like why the Ramones just defied all logic. Like you know what I mean? Like how can they be so good and be so weird and be so awkward and so awesome and like they make being a nerd cool? It's like you know there's these things that in in pop culture and in nerd culture and I've you know spent a lot of my time in nerd culture. There's certain like hallmarks that like make being a nerd cool and like you know you can whether you dungeons and dragons is one of them you have the movie revenge of the nerds is another devo made nerds cool and night you know the ramones made being a tall gangly weird ass motherfucker who you didn't know how to wear anything but jeans and a white t-shirt cool like that's something that's that changed pop culture you can't underestimate like that sort of impact pre-internet that like just looking a certain way and then having your band travel could literally change the way every kid in that city dressed after your band went there. And that yeah. was the weird thing about the Ramones. And they did this all over the United States and they did this all over Europe. They were the pied pipers of not giving a fuck and doing your own thing because like they went to England and then you got the dam and the sex pistols. You know, they went to Cleveland and you got the dead boys and Pierre Ubu. They went to LA, you got the runaways. It's like wherever the Ramones went, whoever was in that audience started the band that became the Ramones of their city. Yeah. And it was all sincere. I mean, that's the, that yeah. was. Yeah. And they weren't out there trying to spread the word. They were just out there playing gigs, trying to make a goddamn living. You know what I mean? Like they never, there was no gospel at that. I no. was later on that everyone said, Oh, you guys are the, you know, important. They weren't, a, they didn't think they right. were important. They were just a bar band. Just, you know, yeah. Just make, to make money. The next gig is just so we can, you know, get enough money to maybe get ourselves uh, three meals a day if we're lucky. Right. But, you know, and and again, you know, we, we've made this connection a bunch of times because we're both such super freak fans. But, you know, Van Halen and the Ramones did play some gigs together. And I and it's another sort of um, comparison is I feel like Van Halen was that same way where, like, when they started off, they don't they didn't realize they were revolutionaries. They were just like a hardworking band. But what happened with Van Halen in that first tour is that every single city they played new bands started and that became the heavy metal movement yeah. in, in, in the United States. You know what I mean? Like, and it's not to say, of course, black Sabbath was around before that, but like black Sabbath wasn't starting a movement in the United States. They were starting a bunch of 
heavy metal guitar players. When Van Halen, with Roth on vocals, the blonde singer, the hammer on guitar, the whammy bar, the steady bass line, the double kick drum, the flash pots, the whole, that was something different that no one else did. And when they did that, every city they did it in, five bands that sounded and looked like Van Halen started, and that became the entire fucking movement of yeah. 1977 heavy metal in the United States. And those guys, all, all those bands from those days, they as they rise, they're touring so much and then they're right back into the studio that they're living in this bubble that they don't even realize how big they've gotten until maybe a few years after. And, right. you know, then all of a sudden, and then the money starts coming in and all that, but there's or, no, well, or, it, 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 or doesn't come in and the lawsuits. Oh uh, yeah. But you know, but, you in, know, I, in the I, beginning, I, the intent is just, we don't want, we do not want to work nine to five jobs and we're going to do whatever it takes to, to do what we love. Well, and, and also make back a living. then both, most of those guys had shitty record deals. So like, meaning they would come off of a year of touring and be told you owe us $50,000. Yeah. I remember this. The, the, yeah. After Van Halen won, they talked about that. They, they owed right. money after Van Halen. Won. Right. And Alex so was like, wait even, a minute, you're telling me we just <clears throat> sold, uh, Seven million copies, and uh, we got how much? <laughs> how much is yeah, left we owe over you? for us? Yeah, we owe you. <clears throat> yeah, right. So, so you know, but the I Motown deal that, is what Eddie called it. The Motown deal. That's exactly right. It's the you know back to even before that's the Chess Records deal. It's yeah. the basically here instead of royalties, I'll give you a Cadillac. You know. Yeah. Um, but I will say that all those bands back then, Cheap Trick, Kiss, Van Halen, you know, these bands that were just. ACDC, they were cranking out album tour, album tour, album tour. And you talk, you know, you hear these interviews later and they go, oh, it was exhausting. And exhausting. And of course, I'm sure it was. That being said, that is the era that all those bands made all their best records. And there is something to be said, and I've found this in my own career, not that I've, I've ever reached the heights of these arena bands, but in my own career where I, you know, in my a music career where for a while I was in a signed band and we would go on tour and make a record. And I did always find that that, that living in a bubble thing and just like tour record, tour record, you become a machine. And like, you know, there is something to that formula that brings out the best in, in bands. And there's something about that hunger and intensity you get when you're on the road and then just immediately going into the studio and capturing that on record. Uh, of course, it also leads to gigantic drug problems and alcohol problems. And, you know, it's not a great lifestyle in the long yeah. run. But uh, if you look at the records the Stones made, and you know what I mean, all of our favorite bands tended to make their best albums when it was just like boom, 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 boom. They just just kept doing it, you know. Yeah, the Stones. You think about Ramones, ex Exile you know? on Exile on uh, Main Street. You know, they recorded record like ever. 150 degrees inside of that studio. Just yeah. brutal surroundings and the in the most miserable of conditions, and that that just kind of that's that sound is is coming, it's just coming well, off that, of that record. And then those Ramones records, I mean, really, I mean, really, the whole career, but certainly that first decade, they made an album a year. I, I even I want to say at one point, two of them might have come out in the same year, but um, you know, they were cranking out albums. And they had a good run there, man. I mean, you know, you can make arguments as to what your favorite Ramones records are, but it's hard to say anything from those first, say, six, seven albums in a row, song by song. There's just not, there's no misstep. That's what I want to ask you. 14 studio records, seven live albums, bunch of compilation albums, 16 in all, 71 singles, according to Wiki. What's your favorite yeah. Ramones song and why? What's your favorite Ramones album and why? Hmm. Uh, well, album, I'm going to go with, and this is not a traditional pick, but I, I really go with End of the Century. Um, and I say that it, it, it was the first Ramones record that I really got into. Like I said, I, I got into the Ramones because of the movie Rock and Roll High School. That's when I first heard them as a kid. And I bought that album on cassette, End of the Century, which is not the soundtrack to it, but it kind of might as well be. It was the accompanying Phil Spector produced studio album they made in L.A. when they shot the movie Rock and Roll High School. I didn't know any of this at the time, but I knew that all my favorite songs from Rock and Roll High School were on this album. So I bought the album and I have this really specific memory where I took a bus ride um, up to Monterey from Los Angeles to visit my friend and his dad. 
And it was basically my friend was in Monterey for the summer and he said, you know, there's this club near me and it's all ages and they do an open mic and you could come and play guitar here. And I literally took a bus. I'm sure there was probably an open mic 15 minutes from wherever I did, but I didn't know that. And my friend in Monterey told me, so I took a bus all the way to Monterey with my guitar to go play guitar at a club. And I bought the album End of the Century for the bus ride and just listened to it for like, you know, seven, eight hours and kind of got off the bus and was just like, oh my God, this is the greatest record ever. But that's and where so, you literally got on the bus, the Ramones bus. Right? I sure did. Exactly. And I literally, that record walked me right into my first gig ever. Um, so I would say that record's sort of my personal favorite, my favorite Ramones song, boy. Is it one from that album? Uh, do you remember Rock and Roll Radio is a great song? That's a great one. I mean, Rock and Roll High School is a damn near perfect song. Um, I'm going to go, though, with um, I Just Want to Have Something to Do. Yep. Um, that song, to me, is a perfect song. It's got three chords. Um, every section of the song is just a slightly different arrangement of those three chords. It has incredible lyrics. Um, it has... It's simple. It's like a tiny little secret poem uh, that 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 doesn't really make any sense. And he said he goes hanging out on Second Avenue, eating chicken vindaloo. Who else put chicken vindaloo in a verse? It's such a Dee Dee Ramone thing. It's so specific. I could never get it out of my head. And then it's the, got that great thing, and this is why I love the Ramones, is they can summarize it all by just going, da na 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 wait, da na 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 now. And it's just that chant, like fists in the air, couple chords, couple drum hits. It's just like it's an anthem, and they really didn't do anything crazier. It's not like Frank Zappa or something where you listen to go like, oh, my God, this is some really challenging stuff. No wonder it's people that's so bold. This is just like, dudes, you just go, ba na 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 wait. You know, hey, ho, it's so yeah. simple, it, but it's so great. It's like it, it boils music down to me to what what it, it, it really should be, which is just visceral emotion and sort of heart pumping. Like, you, it, you know, when 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 Little Richard comes on, your hips just start moving and you don't understand why. When the Ramones come on, your your fist goes in the air. When Black Sabbath and Dio come on, suddenly the horns come up on you. Don't know why, but you're doing yeah. the devil sign. It's just I you know. know what I mean. Like that's that's what it's all about. I, I guess I'm gonna say. I mean, I love all of the the popular stuff, but I think I, I'm gonna say my favorite might be Pet Cemetery. Pet Cemetery is a great know, one. It, it's a you know it's a it's a poppy one. It's a mainstream one. But that was Joey. Joey loved the the the, the Beatles and the Beach Boys and yeah. He he, he cemetery, had that pop angle to his songwriting. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Pet Cemetery, I think. I'm trying to think who produced that song. I know that off that same album, Dave Edmonds from The Rhythmics produced yeah. the song "Howling at the Moon," and I think Pet Cemetery was produced. God, was it John Bavar? So I'll, I'll cheat. Song? Let's see. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to look it up. Or is it? Um, uh, it's someone kind of famous. Let's see. I am. I, I'm ashamed to say I'm going to cheat here. We're going to Google. Do it, Jean. Jean Bavard, Bavard. Right. I got. So yeah. I got it right. By the way, I got it right. I said I think it's Jean Bavard. You did Jean get Bavard it right. was in the Plasmatics, uh, the later era of Wendy O. Williams in the Plasmatics, and he also wrote some songs with Kiss and Paul Stanley. He was the Mo, he was it, mainly visually. He was known as the black guy with a blonde mohawk back in the early '80s, and he was in a bunch of heavy metal and punk rock bands. But I'm oh. a big Wendy O. Williams and Plasmatics fan. So yeah, I I, I'm just I'm a huge horror film fanatic. So I oh, think I made dude. that connection, you know, with Pet Cemetery. You well, you know, and so King. you know that I uh, I played with Thor for many many years. The Thor of rock and roll. Oh yeah. Nightmare. And zombie nightmare, yeah, that's cool. I, in fact, I'm on, I've, I've produced the last like six Thor albums and play How about on that? them. Yeah, he was I on uh, he was on three sides of the coin, the Kiss podcast. Uh, I want to say yeah, maybe a year Thor's ago great. or so. That I is cool. Actually, Performance rock produced, uh, at its best. I just produced three songs uh, and wrote three songs on his new album coming out in a few months. That's cool, man. You've done you've, you've done just about everything. 
That's why I'm going to have you back on many times. <laughs> the Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. We're back with more of the Booked on Rock podcast. The next book is one that you author. This is this is your baby here. This is the uh, uh, the book all about the 1980 album titled End of the Century. And right. you know you first heard this album as the soundtrack to your first real teenage weekend of partying with older kids, doing drugs, and slurping down inappropriate amounts of booze. So this yeah. this this is the album that gets you started. So many albums to choose from. You really explain why you you love this album and why you chose to write the book. So let's let's get right to it because this is Phil Spector. Enter Phil Spector, man. What a Odd guy yeah. to say the least. And on paper, it seemed like a crazy pairing. Like the personalities were likely to clash and they did. Personality wise, it definitely seemed like a bizarre choice. But musically, in a weird way, to me, it doesn't seem all that that odd because the Ramones always had that sort of 60s girl band, um, you know, and that sort of uh, 60s pop thing going on in their sound so to have you know the the master of that sound and they called it the wall of sound to have him produce the ramones um i don't know that kind of makes sense to me and like i said i actually really like that record a lot i feel like it 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 captures what the ramones are about but it also adds a lot of sonic elements in a good way um that kind of complement what they're about but personality wise you couldn't have found two camps that were more opposite of each other. You know, uh, Phil Spector was a, a gun toting, very eccentric guy who essentially lived in like a castle like mansion and kind of would go to the clubs and find girls or hangers on or people he wanted to party with and bring them back to his place. But then he would kind of take control and it was sort of like you would kind of do what he wanted to do or watch what he wanted to watch or listen to what he wanted to listen to and leave when he, he wanted you to leave. Now, of course, we all know that the that the result of one of those evenings was taking home a, a young actress named Lana Clarkson who wanted to leave and he wouldn't let her. And he allegedly, or I guess at this point, since he's guilty for it, we don't have to say allegedly, he shot her in the face. Um, during the Ramon stay there, there was all sorts of wacky shenanigans. Uh, and a lot of it was stuff like there was a movie at the time starring Anthony Hopkins called Magic, and it was basically about an insane ventriloquist. And I'm not sure exactly what the connection was. I don't know whether Phil Spector just got a copy of this through a friend and enjoyed the movie, or possibly maybe he had, you know, done some work on it, uncredited, or maybe, you know, was going to work. Somehow he ended up with a reel-to-reel print of the movie Magic, I think maybe even before it was out. And sort of forced the Ramones for like hours and hours and hours to just watch this movie over and over again, which he was fascinated with. But no one, you know, I'm sure like, I'm sure, you know, like Johnny was a horror movie guy. I'm sure like the first time they watched it, they were like, cool, we're watching a horror movie with <laughs> Phil Spector. But then by like the sixth time, they're like, holy shit, get me the fuck out of here. I can't watch this movie anymore. And, you know, he wouldn't let you leave and he had bodyguards and they were intimidating. He was sort of like, you know, you'd stay there and just, drink and do drugs or whatever until Phil let you leave. So there was this sort of weird, like we want to work with this guy, but wow, he's so weird and eccentric. And as time went on, those eccentricities became a real breaking point for the band. And they started kind of, you know, being at war with, with Phil. And a couple examples are well, the, the magic one, that movie, the ventriloquism one is one, but one of them is that um, the, intro to um is it i think it's rock and roll high school or is it do you remember rock and roll radio no no i think it's right well i think i know where rock you're going with this yeah he, well, added he, does something. This, he does this yeah he does this opening a chord yes goes, in the beginning kind of rings out and it, you know it's a bitchin chord he made johnny do that like 70 something times one chord and just kept t- and it wasn't that they were tweaking the amp or the mic placement it was johnny needed to play it better or differently he had something in his head but again these you know phil specter was also doing a lot of drugs and staying up doing crazy hours and so he had this idea and he was just torturing these guys and johnny ramone is the not the guy you want to play these mind games with like he had it 
So he stormed out of there and was like, fuck you. And, you know, he ended up flying back to L.A. at one point. Or he ended up flying back to New York from L.A. at one point because he was just so frustrated. And he had a family issue and he just bailed the sessions and stormed out at one point. And then at one point, Dee Dee came to, you know, got into a, a sort of a boiling point with Phil and Phil pulled a gun on him. Well, this is the, yeah, obviously the, didn't shoot him in the face, but yeah. uh, but pulled a gun on him. And, you know, these, these are kids. These are street kids from Queens, man. Like, you, you know, they're not they're not playing this stuff. You know, by the way, Johnny's the one who also had the nerve to get up and leave when when he was forcing them to. to yeah, you know, you're right. You write this in the book. Yeah. He's the one who said yeah, he, he left. I'm and gone. I think he had. He he ended up going back to New York. I think that his uh, I think that his father might have died again. I I forgive myself. I forgive forgive me for not having all these details because I wrote this book like fifteen years ago and I don't necessarily yeah. keep all refresh. But I want to say that his father got sick or passed away or had a heart attack or something like that, where he ended up going back to New York. Yes, you did write um, about something like it's in. Right. Yeah. And it's, he, uh, it's in the and, book. Yeah. And, and I think he had told them that he wanted to do that. And Phil was like, no way, no way you're staying here. And then tortured him with this guitar cord. And Johnny was just like, F this. And he split. He's, yeah. He's like, he's lucky he didn't get there. killed then, you know, yeah. knowing what yeah. happened in the, in, you know, in the years to come with Spectre. But Joey's, yeah, Joey's I mean, the one who really wanted Phil Spectre, right? He's the one. Yeah. I think Joey pushed for that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think they all really admired Phil Spectre, yeah. but I think that, they all thought it was an oddball pairing and might not work. And Joey was the one who really thought it could work. And in my opinion, Joey was right. I think it's a great record. And I think he brought out stuff from them that, that was um, amazing. Um, but it's not the most traditional Ramones record. And no. definitely the band, I, I think as time went on, the rest of the band warmed up to it. But I think that it was such bad mojo going on at that time that they all kind of walked away from it with a lot of bad blood. Yeah. You write about Didi Ramon wanted to leave the studio after a long day and Phil Spector gets enraged and he's almost like a child. He's stomping his feet, knocked his fist on the mixing board to be a fly on the wall for those sessions. You know, could you know. imagine I mean, if back, they were, if they were recording or filming those? Yeah. Back then Oof. no one had uh, cell phones and, no. and, and we're not the guys who were carrying big, you know, video cameras to their sessions. The Ramones were not making tons of money and documenting everything, you know? Yeah. And and you're right. Despite all this, Joey still loved Phil Spector. I mean, despite all that crazy stuff, he was the one I who, think so. you know, stayed close with, with Phil. I don't know if they stayed, I don't or know if they stayed at least close, during that process. I just after. think that he, I think that he had, that his reverence and respect for Phil outweighed his um uncomfortableness for maybe phil as a human being you know what i mean whereas i think the other guys very quickly just went like i don't care how good his records are like i'm over it i don't you know fuck this guy whereas i think joey was probably more like hey man he's an artist you know he's an eccentric you know cut him a break the record sounds good let's go let's try something different you know joey was an optimist joey always was trying to sort of Joey understood what the band was, but I think Joey was always the one who was the most willing to sort of like, Hey, let's try some new stuff. You yeah. Know? You got to, before I forget, I want to mention, you got a great quote from George Seminero, who was close to the band, right? The producer of their mm-hmm. video in 1990 lifestyles of the Ramones. Also the Oh right. seven concert film, the Ramones it's alive. Yep. Uh, 74 to 96. So he says, quote, a lot of times when you meet movie stars or artists, they're never what you want them to be. Joey was the closest to what anybody would want their rock hero to be. He was warm and friendly, yet still a rock star. It's a cool quote. Yeah, I was lucky enough to meet Joey a few times, and I had a really awesome sort of um, relationship with him towards uh, when I when I met him, which was that um, my band recorded an album called Live on KXLU. This is the Street Walk and Cheetahs. And we went into an LA radio station and made uh, called KXLU and recorded an album. We actually we just went in and recorded our set, but we liked it so much we put it out as a live album. And that album ended up doing really well and getting in Rolling Stone and Spin. And Joey was very on the pulse of, you know, new punk rock and new music happening. And one day when I was working at Pop Smear magazine, I got a call at the office from Joey Ramone. And he literally got my number from a mutual friend and called me up and was like, hey, man, I really love your record. 
my I'm doing a Joey Ramone birthday bash coming up to the Cheetahs want to play. And for a variety of reasons, we couldn't do it, but we stayed in touch. And a few weeks later, I got an email from uh, Kurt Loder from MTV, the VJ. And he was like, hey, I was hanging out with Joey Ramone and he played me a record. I love it. I just want to tell you I'm a big fan now. And like Joey Ramone was like running around spreading the gospel on our band. That's band. And, awesome. Uh, two years in a row, he asked us to play that thing and then he got sick. So yeah. <clears throat> it didn't end up happening. Um, but then before all that, I met him one day when the Cheetahs played a gig with Arthur Lee and Love. It was one of our first gigs, like within our first handful of gigs. And um, Joey showed up to see Arthur Lee and he was just hanging at the bar. And it was like you walked in and there was Joey fucking Ramon, like in a leather jacket, looking exactly like he would on stage by the bar. And I just walked up and was like, uh, Joey, hey, I'm Frank Meyer. And I just sort of babbled my name and introduced myself. And he was like, hey, man, what's going on? We just talked for a minute. And that was it. Like he meaning the guy was a man of the people. Like yeah. you'd see him at the bar hanging out by himself without an entourage. If he liked your band, he would call you up himself and throw you a gig. You know what I mean? Like there was a band called the independence out of New York and he was championing them for years. Like he just did everything he could to yeah. help them out. Like You, you know? talk about his optimism. He does a great cover of what a wonderful world. Sure does. Joey. He sure does. What a voice that guy had, man. Yeah. Did Spectre talk about that album in the years that followed? I mean, did he? Not that I know of. I mean, he oh. might have, um, but he he didn't do a lot of interviews at that. From that point on, he he was not doing a lot of press. Yeah, yeah. He stayed to himself. He was in the castle. So you have on this album. By the way, it, it wasn't a huge hit, but it did okay. Number forty four on Billboard, fourteen in the UK. Mm-hmm. What are the highlights from the album, in your opinion? We talked about some of them from End of the Century. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, everyone knows, uh, do you remember rock and roll radio? That's a great song. Uh, and, uh, rock and roll high school is a great song. I mean, those are two big singles in the, in the Ramones world and they're both awesome. And they're both off that record and they both are kind of salutes to rock and roll, but they also have like these big horn sections and samples of old radio DJs. And they're, they're almost like homages to rock and roll. And I feel like a lot of that's Bill Spector influence. Um, I love the song Chinese rocks off that record. And that's a sort of a controversial song because essentially Dee Dee wrote it with Johnny Thunders of Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers and the New York Dolls. But then when, but then both of them put out versions and didn't credit the other one. So there was always sort of controversy. And then in the Johnny version, his lyric mentions Dee Dee. And then in the Dee Dee version, he mentions Johnny. So it's like they both wrote a song and then had some sort of brief parting of the ways and each recorded it and sort of, screwed the other Ooh. one or whatever they have richard so, uh, hell but, as a but, co-writer here credit well because it was written because it was written during the heartbreakers yeah. it was originally i think called uh like uh, lo- uh, uh what was it It was called something else originally before it was chinese rocks it was called like hurt me or squirt oh, me or something weird like that, that. yes yeah, so it was essentially written as a heartbreakers song with Dee. Dee and the heartbreakers had recorded it and then Dee, Dee recorded it with the ramones and I think there was a little bit of controversy over that song. All right, so that's one to to listen. And to. I also love this. They do a great cover of "Baby I Love You." Yeah, the um, the Ronettes. Which I, I yeah, the Ronette yeah. song. And 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 he, you know, I just love the way Joey Joey sings that's those like Motowny type songs. You know? Yep. Where do you rank the end of the century on the all time Ramones album list? I mean, like I said, for me, it's probably my favorite record. But it, if you want to go, I mean, I would say that. Most fans would consider the first record to be the classic, the classic, because that that's got Blitzkrieg Bop. I mean, you're not gonna get any more seminal than Blitzkrieg Bop, and there is something unbelievable about the rawness of the production of that first record. It's just so raw, and it almost sounds like you're just sitting in the studio with the band. So I I, I suppose that is sort of the classic seminal Ramones record. Um, but, you know, I'm a big end of the century guy. Um, I mean, Rocket to Russia is fantastic and Road to Ruin is fantastic. Those to me, both those albums are like perfect power pop records. You know, they have the Ramones weirdness and the sort of, you know, songs about like 
you know, weasels and miscreants and circus freaks and all the sort of stuff that the Ramones, you know, creeps and uh, all the stuff that the Ramones made sort of comical and made made their twisted world sort of unique. Um, but both those records are like perfect pop records. They're just perfect. And unlike the first album where the production is really raw or unlike end of the century where the production gets a little bit more um, experimental, those records are produced almost like Bay City Rollers records or like sweet records. They're just like perfectly executed. Everything's balanced. It's all about the hooks, 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 hooks. Every single song, there's no fat, there's no guitar solos. They're just perfect. It's perfect music. I like the Ramones more than I like the Beach Boys. And I like the Ramones more than I like most of the Beatles. I definitely think the Beatles, don't get me wrong, I'm not short selling the Beatles or their impact or their ingenuity or just their awesomeness. And, and I love a lot of Beatles. But like for my personal musical taste, when I hear the Ramones, it's just perfect. It's just better. It, and it moves along and it's, it's edgy because I like edgy music. And it's edgy, yet it's just, it's like the greatest pop music ever. You know? yeah. Here's my dog, Mojo, by the way. Hey, Mojo. <laughs> I thought I heard a little uh, yeah he barks okay jangling he, chain that's cool yeah so we have on the road with the Ramones we have when the wall of sound met the New York underground uh, the right. Ramones Phil Spector and end of the century uh, you can get these on Amazon but uh, you know wh where else do you suggest people go to get your books you got a website social media pages yeah I mean as far as just what I'm doing, uh, yes, you can look me up on Instagram at the Frank Meyer, and that's M E Y E R, or you can go to Facebook, and I'm Frank M Meyer. That's my middle initial. Um, and then I've got a YouTube channel where you can check out a zillion videos that I've either, you know, music videos in my bands or, you know, stuff related to my movies or my books or whatever. As far as there's no really one hub for my books because uh, every I've done like eight books, but they're all with different publishers. So, you know what I mean? At some point you kind of just become a, what's the word I'm looking for? A whore, uh, for publishing <laughs> agents. So, uh, you know, I just so sort subtle. of do my thing. So and, yeah. So the easiest thing would just be go to Amazon or, you know, and say, look, yeah, look, look up Frank Meyer because they're all, they're all on big, I mean, every book I've done, I've been really lucky in the publishing world. I've, every book I've written has been on a major publisher they're all in print. Um, and each one either was something I did on my own that was, you know, like a passion project that I managed to get a big publishing deal on or a project work that I did with someone I really admire, like Monty Melnick or Niels Lozauer, you know, these guys who have these incredible stories or incredible body of work that maybe they just need someone like me to help them either organize it or voice it. And, you know, that's... I, I have a big tool belt and I can be your lead singer or your guitar player. I can go make a movie, but I also am someone, I don't always need to be like the lead guy. Like I, I kind of feel like, you know, when you're in a team situation, you have to be fluid. And sometimes you're like the quarterback and, you know, cause every team needs a leader and sometimes you're the best person to be the leader, but sometimes you're not the best person to be the leader. And then if you're not the leader, you got to be kind of cool with letting someone else talk tell you what to do and make the judgment call and don't get all bitchy about it along with oh, well, this what I would do. Like, well, be you're not the leader. That's not your, that's not your role right now. When you're the leader, then you, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and I, I'm kind of very cool being like the side man or the collaborator um, or the front guy, you know, to just whatever the gig is. So when it comes to books, I've found that my role is, tends to be better served as a collaborator and as a support player simply because I, you know, my career as a musician or as a filmmaker is not big enough where someone's asking me to write my, you know, story or whatnot. Um, and I'm a good listener and I'm a good, I'm a good talker. And I, you know, I know how to help people kind of find their voice. Yeah. You have any books, you know, in, in, in the works, any, any ideas in your head as to a next book I you do. want to do? Yeah. I do, I do. Uh, I'm working with Amit Zappa and his company, Monster Foot Productions. Amit and I go way back to when we were little kids, like I mentioned. Uh, Son Diesel of the great I. Frank Zappa. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I grew up around that house and Dweezil taught me how to play guitar and Amit and I go back like literally like to the playground. And so Amit and I are working on some book projects. Uh, I think we're going to work on his book at some point. He's got an interesting story to tell. And I recently directed a documentary film about the history of freestyle rap. And I'm working on a book version of that, which will essentially be an oral history of freestyle rap. Um, and then I've got a few other book projects with like other artists I'm collaborating with to help them tell their story. But I kind of hesitate to mention those because we don't feel, you know, we're pitching books. So I yeah. don't want to like put it out there. I'm doing something and have it not come, did you come take to advantage? fruition. Yeah, you got to be sure. Did yeah, you, exactly. Did you take advantage of COVID? Did you do extra writing during that time? Dude, I did. I, so the second document, the first documentary film that I directed and I edited was called Risen, the story of Shron Hell Raises Smith. It's on Amazon Prime and IMDb and Apple and Google movies and everything. And um, it was about um, a Wu-Tang Clan rapper that had a brain aneurysm and lost the whole left side of his body, including the ability to rap. And I followed him for like five years and actually eight years and um, followed his rehabilitation and recovery and all that stuff. And around that same time, I was doing a lot of work and filming of hip hop artists. And so I took a lot of that content and added more content and directed a movie that's coming out next year called Freestyle 101. And it's about the history of freestyle rap. And that's what that book I just mentioned is going to sort of spin out of. It's narrated by Chuck D of Public Enemy. It stars Ice-T, M.O.P., Mob D, Fat Joe, Del the Funky Homo Sapien, Insane Clown Posse. I mean, like every rapper you've ever heard of, uh, certainly from like the golden era 90s hip hop is all in this movie and will be in the book. Um, so that's going to be my next movie coming out and likely my next book coming out. Yeah. And so that, that's really the project that you took most advantage of your, well, so yeah, so what, what, hap what happened was basically my first film risen came out right at the beginning of COVID. And what I was hoping to do was hire an editor and, uh, and get them to edit this other movie that I'd already shot. But then COVID happened and I suddenly had all this time on my hands and I was working from home and I was like, oh, fuck it. I should just, I mean, who else knows this material better than me? I shot it all or I was, you know, the interviewer on all of it. So I just started editing and I ended up editing that whole film myself. Um, I also really dug into my band, The Streetwalk and Cheetahs had already made a record, but we mixed it, finished it and got that really got signed and got that released. That's our, our new record, One More Drink. Um, and then I started a band camp page and started putting out solo material like that cover of In a Simple Rhyme by Van Halen, which we talked about. Great earlier. cover, so, man. Great cover. Thanks, man. And then um, I really just started grinding. Me and Eddie Spaghetti from the Super Suckers started yeah. a band. Um, so we've now recorded a whole album that's coming out this summer. Um, it's called Motherfucking Rock and Roll. And <laughs> it's basically, it sounds exactly <laughs> like what you think the Super Suckers and the Street Walking Cheetahs sound like. You know, it sounds like a beer bottle smashed across your face with a Les Paul stabbed through your heart. And uh, so that's coming out soon. And then I just started like becoming like this sort of studio guy, like, for a while, I was unemployed and just had to make my living making music. So um, I hooked up with this guy named Corey Clark and the band Warrior Soul. And I played keyboards and sang backing vocals on their last record. And I'm collaborating with him on his new record, on the new Warrior Soul record. I hooked up with this band out of the UK called City Kids and recorded, uh, helped them, you know, record and, and uh, added keyboards and guitars and backing vocals to their record. They hooked me up with this band called Shameless. I played all over their new record. Uh, I have a band out of Long Beach called Blind House. We made a record during this time. I have another band out of Long Beach called The Antivirals, which is members of the Cadillac Tramps. Uh, we made a record. So I really have actually made more music in my entire life in this last year and a half. Never been happier, except for the looming pandemic around yeah that's turn, <laughs> that's turning a lemon into lemonade um when, when do you yeah. think when do you think the touring i know there are bands genesis with phil collins just booked some dates when we, when do you, when do you start touring or have you the streetwalk well so what i've been in doing some some areas they they're they're doing it like te dallas right. texas had a well, guitar festival so, there and I, you know so there are some places for me as a since the band couldn't play for a while out here in southern california i 
started doing acoustic shows and I got together a whole acoustic act where I could basically bob and weave between originals and covers. And I was doing everything from Iron Maiden, Van Halen and Ramones, plus all my street walking cheetah stuff and solo stuff and literally doing like two, three hour sets uh, and making money doing it. So I just started grinding, doing like solo acoustic stuff, playing bars and coffee, anywhere that, you know, outdoor patio shit. And then right now, everything's starting to open up a bit more. So the Street Walking Cheetahs just booked our first gig. We're doing uh, June, is it June, uh, June 16th in Long Beach at D Piazza's and June 17th at the Floor House in San Diego. And these are indoor. Those, be, those are indoors and those will be our first shows in nearly a year and a half. Full and our capacity first shows, or are they going to tell you like 40%? No, nah, I don't think it'll be full okay. capacity. And, like movie theaters and I will, are 40%. Right. It'll be whatever percent they're allowed to do. And that's okay. cool. And that's I'm sure right. I'm not going to, I'm sure I'm not going to do my normal, you know, jumping out in the crowds and spitting beer all over everyone. Cause <laughs> I think a lot of that stuff is a bit off the yeah. table at the moment. Uh, so we'll be appropriate. We're but getting there though. Be, it'll be, it'll be, uh, awesome to play with a drummer. I've been playing acoustic for so long. I just want to hear a fucking drummer. I just want to yeah. hear that goddamn drum behind me you know what i mean yeah pulsating through you right you feel that yeah. bass drum i need it i need it dude well frank meyer man thanks so much for being <laughs> on the podcast yeah. you are the first guest on the booked on rock podcast and this is you know devoted to to guys like you the you know the the creative artist who who among other things writes you know so you, you you're always welcome back here with any book that you're uh, looking to talk about promote and uh you know, it's it's been it's been a pleasure talking with you, man. We we met you know online through emails, et cetera, et cetera. But this is the first time we've chatted, so it's great to talk to you. Thank you, man. Uh, I had a really good time, and it's great talking about all this stuff because you know, for me, being an author and being a musician have always sort of intersected because I I love writing and I love reading and I love music and I always grew up reading rock magazines and comic books and then books about you know autobiographies and biographies about my favorite artists and i just soak that stuff up so it's cool to be able to kind of talk not only about the books but have it sort of intersect with the music because for me it's all kind of coming from the same yeah. place you know yeah like i said you can catch me on instagram at the frank meyer or facebook at frank m meyer you can uh, look me up on youtube i got my own channel and also i've got two band camp pages one is just Frank Meyer, and that's my solo stuff. And then I've got the Street Walk and Cheetahs, and you can buy the vinyl version of our record and digital, and we've got a bunch of CDs and cool shit up there. Uh, so if you if any of this sounds remotely interesting to you and you're like, hey, what kind of music does this maniac make? Uh, you could check that out. And then, like I said, my film uh, Risen, the story of Shron Hell Raises Smith, is available now, among other places. You can get it on IMDb or uh, Amazon Prime. Um, I've got a new film called Freestyle 101 coming out soon, and all my books are still in print. On the road, on the road with Ramones uh, just hit its latest edition. That's the one we're talking about mainly here. You can pick that up on Amazon, and then, um, like I said, I got a few new books coming out. Cool. Thanks to Frank Meyer for taking us through his two books on the Ramones, On the Road with the Ramones. And when the wall of sound met the New York underground, the Ramones, Phil Spector, and the end of the century. Be sure to subscribe to Booked on Rock on Spreaker or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. You can find us online at bookedonrock.com, on Facebook at facebook.com slash bookedonrockpodcast, on Twitter at bookedonrock. The email address is the Podcast at gmail.com. You can also contact us through the website. If you're an author of a book on rock and you want to be on the podcast, just send me an email or contact me through bookedonrock.com. I'm Eric Senich. Look forward to having you back next time for another episode of Booked on Rock. Bye.